For most Americans, the story begins in 1979 with the Iranian Revolution and the hostage crisis. A group of revolutionary university students took over the American embassy in Tehran and held 52 diplomats hostage for 444 days. To help burn this into the American narrative, the news show Nightline was created with a nightly tally of the number of days since the crisis started. But to really understand, we have to go back to 1953, which is where the story begins for most Iranians. This was the year that the U.S. overthrew Iran's democracy and installed the Shah, a pro-U.S. dictator. In 1951, Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh was the first elected official who was appointed as Prime Minister of Iran by popular demand. He saw that the wealth needed to build Iran was leaving the country because over the past 50 years its vast oil reserves were under British control at the hands of the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, later to become BP or British Petroleum. So Mossadegh became hugely popular for nationalizing the oil industry and taking back the oil. Hugely popular at home but quite unpopular with the British government. Britain took Iran to the world court over the matter and lost. They tried to hit Iran's economy by blockading the Gulf and halting trade. They tried to convince the U.S. to assist with regime change, but then-President Truman was not interested. However, when U.S. President Eisenhower took office in 1953, Britain was able to persuade him under the Cold War pretext that Mossadegh relied on Iran's Communist Party for power. The newly formed CIA was sent to engineer a coup, codenamed Operation Ajax. Iran's monarch, the Shah, returned to power. He had previously been weakened by the new parliament, a short democratic experiment designed to limit his powers. After 1953, he returned fully backed by UK and US power, and the oil was soon flowing under control of Britain, America, the Netherlands, and France. The Shah became increasingly arrogant, opulent, and autocratic over his 25-year rule. He instilled fear in the population with a secret police known as Savak, created by the American CIA and Israeli Mossad, that tortured and imprisoned those who dared to dissent. He crushed all political opposition. Troops were sent to massacre demonstrators. He pushed a white revolution to modernize and westernize the country, giving women the right to vote and other reforms. But ultimately, he served the elites and created a huge economic gap for the poor masses. Powerful religious leaders saw that he was forcibly trying to rid Iran of Islam in a country that was 90% Muslim. One of the Shah's leading critics, Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, was arrested and imprisoned for 18 months. After his release in 1964, Khomeini was sent into exile for 14 years. From abroad, he continued his anti-U.S., anti-Shah campaign through sermons on cassette tapes that made their way back into Iran and circulated as people copied and shared them. By the end of the 1970s, things had gotten so bad that major protests and the violence that followed were becoming a regular occurrence. The Shah declared martial law and banned demonstrations. This resulted in a huge protest and a general strike that shut down the economy. Soon over two million people flooded a public square in Tehran, demanding to remove the Shah and for Khomeini to return. And that is exactly what happened. One important thing to note is that the CIA orchestrated the 1953 coup out of the very same American embassy in Tehran that was later the site of the hostage crisis, right after the Shah was overthrown by popular revolution in 1979. The students were convinced that once again, the U.S. had plans to overthrow their revolution. In fact, U.S. President Carter did send a NATO general to instigate a military coup, but it failed. Iran and the U.S. had an extradition treaty in force that obligated the Carter administration to return the Shah to Iran as an indicted criminal. The students had four demands. Return the Shah to Iran for trial he had been accepted into America for medical treatment. Return the Shah's wealth to the Iranian people, a promise from the U.S. not to interfere in Iran's affairs in the future, and an apology and admission of guilt by the U.S. for its past actions in Iran. The apology never came, 
But 20 years later, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright did acknowledge the U.S. role in Mossadegh's overthrow. So Khomeini took power in 1979 and instituted a government under Islamic law. Within a year of the revolution, Saddam Hussein invaded Iran without provocation, seeking control of Iran's oil-rich Khuzestan region and key oil-shipping waterways. The resulting Iran-Iraq war from 1980 to 1988 was the longest and one of the most devastating conventional wars of the century. At least half a million Iranians were killed. This war further cemented resentment of the U.S. government as they were playing both sides. On one hand, they were supporting Iraq, providing money, technology, and intelligence, including satellite photography, to help Iraqi bombing raids. The U.S. helped provide Saddam Hussein with weapons by giving him agricultural credits and pressuring Gulf states to give him billions in loans so he could buy weapons from Western Europe, China, and Russia. The U.S. Department of Commerce issued licenses to export materials for Iraq's weapons of mass destruction program. The U.S. continued its support even after learning that Iraq was using chemical weapons against Iran, not to mention against its own citizens, to stop an uprising of Kurdish separatists. But the imperialist tradition also called for maintaining regional balance of power. So the U.S. also armed Iran, not letting any one regional power get secure enough to dominate or to ally with its neighbors to challenge U.S. hegemony. In this case, it came in the form of the Iran-Contra scandal. U.S. President Reagan needed money to fund an unjustified war against Nicaragua, but was forbidden to do so by Congress. So U.S. arms were illegally sold to Iran through Israel and South Africa, and the proceeds went to the Nicaraguan Contras. This allowed Reagan to get around Congress to support a campaign of kidnap, rape, torture, and murder for which the U.S. was convicted by the World Court for unlawful use of force. In other words, state-sponsored international terrorism. The ruling was ignored. Khomeini died in 1989, shortly after the war ended. He promised democracy, but essentially had become the next dictator. Although he improved literacy and much-needed health care for the masses, he also imposed censorship, violently crushed political dissent, and attacked women's rights. Instead of the sabak, the people now had the Revolutionary Guard to fear. Since then, Iran has been an oppressive theocracy. Khomeini was replaced by Khomeini, who remains supreme leader to this day. As a test of fairness, we might imagine that Iran invaded and occupied Canada and Mexico and had aircraft carriers sitting in the Caribbean. Imagine then if Iran had the power to label the U.S. the axis of evil and cut us off from the rest of the world and then threaten to attack us if we didn't stop generating nuclear power. What if Iran had overthrown the U.S. government 50 years ago and installed a dictator friendly to Iranian interests? who kept it in power for 25 years. At that point, imagine that Christian fundamentalists, who currently represent about a third of the U.S., took power and began ruling under church law, followed by an unprovoked invasion by Canada, supported by Iran and ignored by the U.N., in which it nearly destroyed the U.S. Would it be possible to imagine Iran as liberators? Would Iran be justified in attacking if the U.S. government helped Christian fundamentalists in Canada to take up resistance? Would it be justified to hate and fear all Christians because of the ones that took and abused power in this context? This is not about good guys and bad guys. Both the American and Iranian governments are working against the interests of the people. But the deadly game of chicken was begun by the U.S., and the U.S. has the power to end it. We should look at our current policies and actions against Iran, look at some better options, and figure out a way to change the minds of the people running our government and prevent another criminal enterprise that will cost many more lives. It has been done in the past, and if people take action, it can be done again.